I'm Sonia Morton Firth and you're tuned in to the Sonia Morton Firth Show. Today my guest is Omar Elatar, also known as Omar the Rockstar. Omar is one of the biggest YouTube personalities out there. To date, Omar has built a digital business around his show, The Passionate Few, where he explores the minds of entrepreneurs that have a net worth of over $10 billion. We talk about Omar's secrets to getting the top A-listers on his show, his daily routines that set him up for success, meditation, and how investing in his personal growth has played a huge part in his life. Watch this video to learn some key tips on how you can become a master of your destiny and how you can do anything if you put your mind to it. Omar, it's so good to have you on my show today. And here we are. Here I am sitting in London at about seven o'clock, nearly my tea time. And you're all the way in California. Welcome. Thank you for having me, Sonia. Excited to be on. It's great to have a guest across the pond, which I don't normally do. And thanks to modern technology, we can do this. It's a great. Absolutely. Yes, yes. Omar, you've been quoted as being one of the biggest YouTube personalities. And you interview some of the most prestigious people in business. But where did it all begin? What really started you on this journey? And yes. And you your passion. Yes, the famous question. Um, you know, it's interesting. Um, so I'm at the time of this recording, 28 years old. Yeah. So long story short, uh, I was about four years ago, I'm 24 years old, and I found myself in an interesting situation because growing up, I always wanted to do big things or special things or meaningful things. I always craved um being the best at stuff right like so i played you know soccer or football depending on where in the world you live right I'm definitely football i played that for uh for you know over a decade since i was a kid and i wanted to be a professional and then after that i got into skateboarding and i wanted to be a professional skateboarder and after that i got into acting and filmmaking and i wanted to be professional at that and i always got good at those things but there was always uh some sort of friction that would take me away you know in high school, you know, it was a girlfriend and then it was partying and then it was a little smoking, a little drinking, a little, you know, that kind of thing. So it took me on a detour. Um, and then I found myself, you know, after having all those dreams for all those years and aiming big and listening to interviews and reading biographies and being inspired, I found myself 24 years old, broke, uh, overweight, unhappy, um, working as a salesman at Tesla. And um, although Tesla was cool, it just wasn't, it wasn't fulfilling my soul. I'm going to say, there's probably um, worse places you could be a salesman, right? <laughs> it's true. This is true. There was worse places I could be a salesman. Before that, I was selling solar, uh, solar panels uh, door to door. I was knocking on doors, 100% commission. Mm -hmm. And all the while, I was trying to, I either wanted to do something really big or make a lot, if I was going to suffer and have a job I don't like, I at least wanted to make a lot of money. So that was kind of my thing. And I just, I kept, God bless my heart, because I kept trying to find stuff and nothing worked. I just couldn't get in momentum. And of course, you know, with social media and television, you see everybody at 21 or 22 starting to make money, starting to succeed. And I just found myself and I, felt, I, I had this internal pressure and I felt like the walls were kind of caving in in a certain regard. And um, the reason I'm sharing this with you is just so you understand where I was at emotionally before I would start okay. the show. Was and, there a real low point in it all? Yes, yes it was a very low point because uh, it was, imagine you're trying to make something happen for, you know, 10 plus years and just something after another just keeps happening to get in the way and things don't quite pan out and I'm getting older, you know, and then you start like, ah, I probably can't make it in Hollywood. Ah, it's too late to make it as a professional athlete, ah, you know, so the, and I never aspired to be a doctor or a lawyer or engineer or, a, you know, I never aspired for that. So the few things I put my everything into, my window to actually achieve it was pretty much closed, if not at the tail end of closing, at least in my mind, my perception in my mind. And um, 
And really the low point right before I started was when I was working at Tesla, I had uh, an ex-girlfriend. Her name was Emily. And I loved this girl. Oh my God. From any girl I've ever been with in my life, she was like, you know, the one. Was your first true love? Uh, I think so. Yes. In retrospect, I think so. Yes. Um, you know, in high school and stuff, there was, there was, you know, you have flings or in college or university or whatever, but she was the first one that I, you know, most of the time I kind of was a playboy a little bit or, you know, had a couple of things going on. Uh, but she was the first girl that I was super loyal to super hundred percent. I loved her. I was crazy about her and she was about me too. But I think because I was in such a negative place myself, I think I didn't notice it at the time, but I think that energy seeped into the relationship and in my rock bottom when you know the walls were caving in and she was my everything she actually ended up leaving me so yeah, she broke up with me heart, heartbreak can be one of the most oh, man. painful things i mean it, it, the loss can be i mean greater than death in some cases that's why all the love songs you hear all these love songs it's mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I mean, ninety-seven percent of uh, music is actually about relationships. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it it became it became, and I remember I was at the gym, and I got this weird feeling in my body. I don't know if you've ever had this experience where you get this like um like uh, anxiety sensation for no reason to yourself. You have no reason to. There's no nothing immediately in your life going on, but it's like a sixth sense. And uh, I get out of the gym when I had that feeling and she's calling me. And I remember looking at the phone thinking, oh, shit, this is not going to be good oh. news. You know? So I answer and she just broke up with me on the phone right then oh. and there. No, uh, no warning. No, let's talk about it. No, um, let's work on things. It was just, you know, I can't do this. I've been thinking about it. I'm out. And just like that, everything we had built, just like that, gone. And in, in that moment, if you remember back, how did you feel? What, what was that real? That was rough. I remember I was at the gym and um, I sat down. I couldn't, I couldn't walk. I was, you know, your mouth's dry, your heart's racing. You can't think. You, and, you, and then I'm torn between trying to accept the reality, but then I'm also, the other half of me wants to talk to her and try to solve it. But then I, you know, but then I don't know if I do, and I don't know if it's pointless because it's already been this far. You know, do I really want to beg someone to stay with me? You know, and I wasn't expecting it, and I'm already overwhelmed from this other stuff. So it was just a slew of stuff, and I remember uh, just sitting down on the steps and just crying. And I just remember thinking, like, pardon my language, but just like, fuck, like, I have no money, um, I have no direction. I have nobody to support me. I have no, the girl that I was all about doesn't even care about me. So I'm like, fuck. So here I am in my mid twenties, um, which I know, and, and I know it's in funny because I know to a lot of people listening, they go, oh my God, that's so young. But when you have so much pressure on yourself at such a young age, you know, I could have been 54, you know, in terms of the pressure I was feeling. And I just remember that, you know, just sitting there and just crying and just crying and crying and finally, you know, getting in my car and just driving and just, you know, I couldn't, you know, music was probably playing, but I couldn't hear it, you know, I, you know, and then for a couple of days, you know, I couldn't sleep, I couldn't, you know, everything I do, I think about them, every song reminds me of them, mm -hmm. I couldn't eat, I couldn't, you know, and it was days and I, and I just remember thinking like, fuck, how can this be my life? Like I had so many goals and dreams and aspirations and I've been listening to Tony Robbins and like, and I'm like putting all the right stuff in my mind. Why do I just keep, I'm a good dude. I have a good heart. Why does, why does this keep happening? You know? And literally it was that day um, that I just, I remember it was, it was, it was not that day, but it was like that day I started the gears turning and saying, man, I can't like, like, fuck this. I can't do this. Like, well, I have to change my life. I have to do something drastic. I was going to drive and get a tattoo. I needed to do something super extreme to just 180 my whole mindset. And uh, it's, it's interesting. A pattern interrupt. I think pattern it. Interrupt. Yes. <laughs> yes. I needed to pattern interrupt. Um, that's a perfect way to put it. I needed to do something. But of course, you know, the emotional thing had to land. So, um, Long story short, I go home and uh, I'm crying and I write down in my journal, I'm going to change my life, I'm going to do all this. 
and there I still have the notebook with dried up tears on the page because you know tears were uh, running down my face and so I call have maybe to my name I maybe have eight hundred dollars or something like that nothing barely anything and I remember thinking like okay I can't do this alone so I, I reached out to one of my buddies who had a life coach I um, called this life coach I didn't research or anything just called him I want to hire you. I didn't even ask or think about it. I said, let's meet up. I, I you know, I need help. <laughs> and and so, that in itself is quite a great move because a lot of people yeah. wouldn't have necessarily thought of going to a coach. I mean, uh, you know, right. I'm a coach, you're a coach. We know the importance of coaching and, and what it can bring. But um, yes. for you to actually take, I think part of that is you can take a candle to water, but you can't make it drink. 100%. And and they say, you know, when the student is ready, the teacher, the teacher will appear. <laughs> yes. And uh, the pressure was built up so high that I was like a volcano waiting to erupt. I just didn't have a direction to channel it into. And so long story short, I meet up with the coach and we do this whole session. It's supposed to be an hour. We ended up going for three hours. God bless his soul. His name is Dave Thorpe. Shout out to Dave Thorpe. Dave Thorpe. Uh, it's still one of my coaches. I love him. And, uh, and it's crazy because that day, you know, he asked me a question that changed my entire life. He said, he said, okay, you know, we can't control the past. Right. He said, but let me ask you, Omar, if life was perfect, what would happen next? And I remember for the first time in my life, somebody gave me permission to dream perfect. I think so often in life, sometimes we're just never prompted. You know, I th like, think about it. How many people in life are ever asked? I was 24 years old. The first time a human being ever asked me, hey, what would happen next if life was perfect? Yeah. I think so many of us are always assume that we can't have it our way. We assume we can't have the relationship. We assume we can't have the money. We assume we can't have the passion or the purpose or the business. We just assume that you know we can try but we'll have to compromise yeah we, set, we settle or, or we settle with society's norms our parents yeah. values what other people want what social media want what everyone else wants but it's until you give permission to yourself yes yeah exactly and sometimes and sometimes you need to borrow um that faith or that permission from somebody else that you trust and so that night i remember he asked me that and i said whoa i've never and all of a sudden it opened up all these new possibilities that were not ever accessed prior. You know, like I know me and you both love Tony Robbins, you know, Tony has this beautiful line about, um, you know, high quality life comes from high quality questions. If you want to change your life, change your questions. You know, if I say, Sonia, what color are your socks or your jeans? Right. You don't have to answer it. Uh, you might not have to answer it, <laughs> but you're, but if you, right, if you did have pants or socks on, then you would go inside your brain and your brain would come up with the answer and say, oh, they're white or blue or black or whatever. Even if you don't share it out loud, right? You ask your brain a question, it'll give you an answer. And so many of us just never ask an intentional question. You ask um, assumptive questions, right? And so, you know, I asked my brain if life was perfect, what would happen? And so me and Dave just, instead of thinking about what we were going to do with my life, we just thought about the ingredients, right? Imagine being a chef. Instead of saying, you know, what are, what are we going to make as the entree? We just isolated the ingredients. He said, okay, what ingredients would be part of your future? And I said, well, I love to communicate. I love to meet amazing people. I want to inspire millions of people. I want to talk to people like Tony Robbins and Grant Cardone and all these authors and thought leaders. I would love to make them my friends. I would love to make millions of dollars. I would love to have uh, a team of people who help me. Um, I love biographies. I love inspiring stories. And, and now as you hear this, you might see, ah, okay, that's how the podcast started. But at the time I wasn't thinking it, I was just taking inventory of the ingredients. I was just sort of spewing them out. And this is even now what I do in business. And I recommend people do this. If you're ever lost or trying to find direction or purpose for anybody listening to Sonia's show, uh, I recommend, you know, at any level, maybe you're already doing well and you want to get to the next level, or maybe you're stuck and want to get a momentum. Um, imagine yourself like a chef and instead of pressuring yourself to make entrees, just isolate the ingredients and say, okay, what ingredients do I have? And based on that, you can get creative to bake your, you know, your perfect cake or your entree or whatever. Um, and so I just did that. I wrote down all these things and 
you know, we brainstormed for about an hour. What about this? What about this? What about this? What about that? And they, you know, Dave would go on to say, well, you know, cause I told him, I said, well, ah, I looked at all the ingredients and I said, ah, I want to work for a radio station. Right. That oh, was my, get that, right? yeah, I guess you put some ingredients in Is it going to be a Victoria sponge, a chocolate cake or a red right. velvet, you know? Right. And many, many of the same ingredients can make multiple things. And there's no wrong answer. That's, that's the thing. But I didn't see podcasts or YouTube or, you know, money or any of that. I said, oh, I, I should work at a radio station. And then I said, but, but Dave, I don't have any broadcasting experience. I don't have any radio experience. And he said, well, you have YouTube. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, if you got one of these people to agree to do an interview, couldn't you put it on YouTube? And I said, well, yeah, but you know, I don't know how it works. I don't know what it is. He said, well, could you figure it out? And I said, yeah, but how would I do that? How would I sustain that? How would I make money? He goes, just do it once. Don't overwhelm yourself with all these things. Just, just do one. I said, okay, well, what's step one? He said, reach out to people and ask them if they would do an interview. And I said, really you think it'll work? He said, I don't know. Try it. So I tried it and it worked, you know, on and on they went. And how, you know, how did you come up with the title, The Passionate Few? Because I love it. I think it's amazing. I love yeah. that name, The Passionate Few in it. And it talks to you. But where, where did you get it from? What was the inspiration for that? You know, it's interesting. I'm a very, um, I, I, particularly at this time, I was a very, I'm, a, I'm big on meaning. Like I'm a huge, meaningful guy. Even now, I don't. I have a hard time watching films or movies if they're not meaningful, right? I like inspiring movies. I can watch other movies, comedies, all this action, all. But to me, I like things that have meaning, right? Like it. I would. I hate to waste my time on unmeaningful things. Um, and so, with the show, I wanted to that to be an extension of that. So, I was like, I want. I don't want it to just be named after me. Nothing wrong with that. It, I think that would be the second thing. But just at that time. I wanted something um, that people heard it and they felt something. And so I was thinking like, like okay, I could call it the Omar Alator show. I could call it Inspired Minds podcast. And, and, I, and I just remember thinking like, okay, what do they all have in common? Um, they're inspired, they're motivated, they're, um, they're, they're, there's not a lot of them. Okay, so there's like a few, what are a few people? Inspired, passionate. Okay, a few of them are inspired and passionate. The inspired few, the passionate few. And I just rifled off names and just for whatever reason, that combination of the passionate few. In retrospect, I feel like it was divinely given, like God or the universe kind of like, um, to me, it seemed like a coincidence, but it just kind of flowed. I'm, I'm a pretty- This thing is coincidences. <laughs> right. Well, actually, what's, what's, in, what's interesting, Sonia, is actually that, um, and I learned this from uh, Demartini, is that coincidence, um, a lot of people have misconstrued it to mean a, a haphazard um, yeah. occurrence where two things happen to line up. But coincidence's root is actually coincide, and it's when intentional events coincide. Uh, it's not, it, but most people use coincidence as um, a random occurrence that happened to work out. But coincidence is actually an intentional occurrence, um, and it comes from astrology uh, when the moon coincides uh, with certain events out in space. So that's very interesting that coincide is actually intentional. And, um, and, and actually, those that can actually recognize that it's intentional, right. do something about it, take the opportunity. Right. Think, wow, this is a gift. <laughs> this, right. is, this is not a coincidence. This is a, a, a universe, like you say, I completely agree totally. you when you say that. Um, totally. I love your language, by the way. You're talking, yes. you're talking my language. Yes. <laughs> yes, I know. Yes, no, I love that. That's why I love my my inspired souls, my Tony Robbins people, and my personal development people. Yes. They get it. And uh, yeah, so long story short, you know, I I just I put it into action. I wasn't really sure about what I was doing, but you know, I reached out to one person. Um, I got a yes. I put that up on the channel. People loved it. I did it again. I did it again. I did it again and then I just started trying to get bigger names and my first year um, being in this inspired space um, I just you know I just again I named it the passionate few and I just knew and it actually to go back to the name thing really quick 
I remember being torn and having a hard time making a decision because I was like, man, whatever I pick, that's it. Like I'm running with it for life. Yeah. So I was, um, I was in my car and I was at a, a stoplight and it was like a red stoplight and, you know, it turns green, you go. And um, it was a long stoplight for some reason. And I remember telling myself, and I was the first car and there was a bunch of cars behind me at the red light. And I was kind of undecided um, between the passionate few and a couple other names, even though passionate few was like the leading one. And I just remember like cycling through all the names and telling myself, no matter what, when this light turns green, I'm not going to go or press the gas until I decide on the name. Um, because remember, I had the pain of the breakup. I had the pain of all this stuff. And I, I wanted to move fast. My whole thing was I want to move fast. I want to, I want to blow people's minds. I want to prove to my ex-girlfriend that like she made a mistake, right? Like I want to move because my whole life I had felt like I was moving slow. So, you know, in that first year, it was like, I thought of the name by the end of the day, I had three different people working on a logo and I, and mind you, I had no money. So I would, I was moving fast with no money. So, but, but I was creative, right? So I, I remember like, I got the best logo designer I could find. It was like $1,100. And I said, hey, look, just want to be totally honest about my situation. This is what I want to do. Um, you know, I can't really afford $1,100, but if you can hook me up with anything, I'll take it. But I, was in, I wanted to overcommit. I was okay putting myself in a financial pinch for the momentum of, you know, the, what I was building. I just, in my heart and my soul, I was going to channel all my frustration, energy into this for once in my life. So I, I went, you know, they say going all in, I imagine me at a poker table. I went all in on money that wasn't even mine. And he said, okay, I'll tell you what, you know, I like you and, you know, and, and I understand you're a young hustler. So I'll do it for 400. I said, okay. He said, okay. You know, I'll have designs for you to buy tomorrow. I said, okay. Called my sister. I said, my sister's name is Sarah. I said, Hey Sarah, uh, long story, but can I borrow $400? <laughs> uh, so I borrowed money from her. Thank God she let me borrow it. Paid him, got the logos, started the channel, got the interview. Everything was happening. And I remember fast. And um, and mind you, and this is an interesting part for people listening, is, you know, when I started the show, um, I wanted a big a chip on my shoulder was proving my ex-girlfriend, em Emily, you know, wrong. That she, uh, you know, how dare you leave me kind of, right? That ego, you know, that manly ego. Because in the past, I was always the one that left the girls or broke it off or whatever. And now this time I was loyal, loving, connected. And we had a great relationship um, up until, you know, maybe that last month where we were starting to have challenges and she left me. So I wanted to prove to her. You were rejected, right? Ultimately, I was, wow, that is rejection. Yes. horrible. It's horrible. Rejected. Rejected. And, rejection, it's, mm -hmm. yeah. and also I was, I was at a point where my confidence was so low. So it was kind of like, you know, she was kind of my pillow that I, that I vented to, you know, and in retrospect, that's probably why she left me. So, you know, I, I get it and I don't fault her for that. And I wish her the best and, you know, we're cool. But at the time, I'm just telling you how my mind was yeah. viewing it. But do you see now how her leaving you was probably the best thing that ever happened to you? Yeah. Oh my goodness. She's, she's responsible for so much of my yeah. uh, opportunity, fulfillment, finances, impact. Uh, if it was, I thanked her. Um, I thanked her, uh, God, maybe a year and a half ago or so, and she didn't really get it, but, um, you know, I would, and it was more important for me internally to feel grateful for her than to tell her, but, but yes, had that not happened, that was the best thing that could have happened in my life. Yeah. None of this would exist. I wouldn't be living my dreams. I wouldn't, you know, Tony Robbins invited me in December to go out to date with Destiny free of charge as his guest. I got to go backstage and hang out with Tony. And I just remember thinking in my head, wow, this is the, I'm a living, breathing example of turning your pain into power, turning your mess into a message, turning a bad situation because of how I psychologically manipulate the meaning of it to make my life work. Whoa, like, I can't believe I get to be me, you know? Yeah. Um, but when I, when I broke up with her to go back to this, I, this was in the first year, I was so inspired and driven that um, my ex-girlfriend, she loved three things more than anything. Um, she loved working out, right? She's super into fitness and health. And she loved Quest Bars, you know, Quest yeah, Nutrition. I know Quest Bars. Yes. Yes. So Quest Bars, loved, protein bars. Yes. Yeah. She loved Quest Bars. Um, 
She also loved Grant Cardone. She worked in sales. And I had, at that time, I had never heard of Grant Cardone. Um, but I remember by her bed in her room, she had this huge thing and she had all of his books and CDs and audio trainings at work. They would give it to her. And I was like, who's Grant Cardone? She was like, oh, he's a sales trainer. You got to check him out. You got to listen to him. So she loved Quest Bars. She loved Grant Cardone. And in the US, uh, I don't know if you guys have them in the UK, but they have what's called Hot Cheetos. And she loved those. And I remember in my mind, I said, man, wouldn't that be crazy if I interviewed the founder of all of those? And so I said, you know what? F it. Let's do it. You know? And so I wrote down, I wrote down this list of all my dream guests, right? In this inspired state. Uh, I wrote down Tony Robbins, Jordan Belfort, Grant Cardone. I wrote down all these names. And Sonia, wouldn't you know it, years later, all those names have been checked off the list. And how did um, you do that? Because, yeah. you know, there's one thing to say, you know, I've got a dream and, and I can visualize it and picture it. And, you know, there's so many people out there. We've all heard of the law of attraction, the secret, yes. um, many of those powerful self-help help books. And there's a lot of great stuff in there. Yeah. But there, there is an ingredient that you yeah. have. There's a lot of people that are watching this are thinking, well, I think about making a million bucks every day and that doesn't come through my door. What yeah. was that secret ingredient that turned those dreams into a reality? It was so real in my mind. It was so real. Um, even at times later, I would try to recreate that feeling, but it was so intensely real in my mind. You know, and, and I, I think that we move towards the image. We, I'm a firm believer that we move towards the image we hold in our mind. Firm believer of that. You know, I see a lot of people who, you know, for example, we all have parents, right? A lot of parents, they maybe when they think of themselves at 70 or 80, imagine themselves, um, you know, brittle, sore, having a hard time walking. And they're perfectly healthy at, you know, 40, 50, whatever, 30. And But when they think of their future, they imagine that. There are other people, you know, I go to the gym. I know people who are 70 and 80 are in the best shape of their life. Yeah, yeah. Energy and vitality. Mm -hmm. But I would bet you that the people that had energy and vitality visualized that all along. They saw themselves as healthy. I'm a complete believer in if you believe you're going to get sick, you're going to get sick. Right. You know, it, it's totally because their body respond. I mean, think about it. Because their body respond. I mean, think about it. Um, Dr. Demartini said, you know, stress Stress is not something that biologically happens before it happens psychological. Stress is psychological. And then your body uh, manifests what you were thinking. Mm -hmm. So the same way you can stress yourself with your thoughts, if you can make yourself sick with your thoughts, you can make yourself healthy with your thoughts too. Why would the pendulum only swing one way and not the other? Not the other. It has to swing yeah. both ways. Absolutely. Exactly. And, um, and so, yes, yeah, so long story short, I, you know, I wrote down this list and I, it, 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 Sonia, it was so emotionally intense um, that I just, I just knew it. I just knew it. I could, I could see it. I could hear Tony Robbins say, hi, I'm Tony Robbins. I'm one of the passionate few. I could, I could see it. I could feel it. I could smell it. I could see what he was wearing. I will, I could, it was so real. And, uh, and I think that's what most people don't do. I think one of the other things too, that I've begun to consciously realize is that I think what I used to, how I used to dream prior before things started happening is I would, I would visualize or think or dream or goal set as if the goal was somewhere over there, like a movie playing. Yeah. Um, but that didn't work for me. What worked is when I started visualizing from my eyeballs perspective. And I know that sounds silly, but it's a minute distinction that has changed the whole game for me. So now when I visualize, I don't imagine Omar interviewing Tony Robbins over there in a movie. I imagine Tony Robbins in front of me in my eyeballs. I'm shaking his hand. He's looking at my eyes. I, I visualize from my, the real world perspective yeah. that I would experience it through. Not through a movie over there, but through my actual eyeballs. So I know that sounds so silly when I tell people. No, no I, I get it. It's, it's quite difficult to do, though, isn't it? Because right. I, I, I know that a similar thing. And when I'm visualizing, I've got some real strong visualizations as well. And I sometimes I'm, I'm like seeing myself sitting there and, and, and thinking, yeah. right, don't see yourself. You actually, you are in that chair. Yeah. You're there and doing it. And Right. Visualize it as your eyeballs would experience it. So, you know, so I imagine myself, so I imagine Tony talking to me. I imagined, I don't imagine it's a movie over there. I imagine Tony's talking to me, Grant's time. And I would just do this over and over and over and over. And I would imagine that, oh yeah, like we're cool. They know me, they know my, they respect my body of work. 
And it was just so intense, um, fueled by the frustration of this, that literally it popped into reality, you know? And there's there's been times that surreal is like, it, because it it literally happened at the same rhythm that it, the frequency that happened in my brain. But long story short, you know, I wrote down um, that I wanted to interview the founder of all those companies uh, from Emily's favorite things, right? Quest Bars, Hot Cheetos, and Grant Cardone, and Sonia. Um, I'll get I can get into the story of how I got each one of them for an interview with zero experience. But not only did I get all of them for an interview um, within my first year. Every single one of them ended up being the most watched and downloaded interview on all of YouTube and iTunes with all of them, my first try with and all of them. You say that is the secret to your success in terms of where you, how you built this platform and, and how it's literally gone from, from zero to, to right up there. Yeah, we have just a little over 7 million uh, listeners worldwide. And I think that the reason... Yeah. You know, when I started it, I, you know, and I help people now launch and start yeah. their own show. And, and one thing now is that a, I think a lot of people and nothing wrong with it. Um, I think it's a phenomenal tool in social media. I think there are many people who um, have different motivations to start, all of which are good. Some want to build their brand. Some want to inspire the world. Some want to um, create revenue, generate leads, right? There's a lot of different and you can have all of those things in one. But to me, when I started, it was, it was for, I had such an emotional charge for why I was doing it that I think it just manifested um, in the nuances of the energy of from how I interviewed them to how it was filmed to the questions I asked to what I pulled out of them. I just think that energetically, it just attracted the right thing because of the intensity, the frequency. You have to understand for me, you know, when I went into an interview, it, particularly then, I mean, I still do this, but particularly in the beginning, the, the, I was going to uh, uh, an intellectual war, so to speak, not with the person, but like, I was so intent. This to me was like the world cup. You know, this to me was like, this is my one opportunity to blow the world away, prove Emily wrong. Like she's going to see this. I have to bedazzle the whole thing. Right. Yeah. So I made this like such an emotional, intense thing and it had nothing to do with money. It had nothing to do with me looking cool. It had nothing to do with any of that. It had to purely do with, you know, which is still now my mission statement. My goal is to create the best interview with every single human being that I do. And my goal is always that I want their children and their family for decades into the future to watch this interview. So I make that prayer before I do any interview, I have a little ritual where I'm not just trying to interview them for a conversation. This is literally the most, I, I go into it to, I'm here to extract everything out of their soul and put it out there for the world to see so that their children, their grandchildren, everything. so to me, it was such an extremely dramatic intention that I just think whether I hit it or not, um, I think people felt that with my content. Um, and what you know, makes, because this is so interesting, as, yeah. as a fellow interviewer, yes, yeah. what makes a good interview you say you want to get yeah. into their souls and, and bring something yeah. out firstly how, how do you do that what how, what do you what do you do to to make that happen so everybody loves to talk about themselves right particularly people who've done something interesting and nothing wrong with that but what i try to do is i, I consider myself a professional provoker a professional provoker meaning I think as an interviewer, my job is to poke you because in certain areas and you'll, your, your response is the magic. Um, but as an interviewer, I think it's not about um, how much you say or what you ask as much as the, 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 the place you ask. So for example, let's say, um, you know, let's say, uh, let's say they're telling me, let's go to Tom Billy, for example. During the interview, he was telling me how him and Lisa were totally broke and they used to drive in their car in Beverly Hills and drive around mansions and have no money and fantasize, you know, honey, one day we'll live here, we can do it. And ironically, they would end up living, this is very interesting, Sonia, and for people listening, they ended up actually moving into one of the homes that they used to drive around mm -hmm. and, the same, and the security guard kicked them out years ago because they were driving and was like, hey, you got to get out of here because it was in Beverly Hills the same security guard was working as a security guard when they moved into the house in Beverly Hills. Well, isn't that's that called karma. <laughs> yeah. But isn't, isn't that interesting? Yeah, very interesting. Right. 
but like, for example, you know, when Tom tells me that most interviewers would see that and move to the next thing, but I will zoom in right there and I'll say, well, Tom, take me back. You know, when you and Lisa were doing that driving around, was part of you convinced that would happen? Or was there a lot of insecurities? Like, ah, maybe this isn't, were you trying to delude yourself a little bit? Like, did part of you feel like you couldn't? And I know that doesn't sound like a big deal, but when you zoom in on those distinctions of questions, I'm permanently aware of who's listening to these interviews. And it's the version of me who's looking for answers. So I'm not asking to have a conversation. I'm permanently assuming that somebody who's totally broke is listening to this. Somebody who's just gone through a divorce is listening to this. Somebody who's smoking a joint right now is listening to this, trying to change their life. Somebody who's maybe a little bit tipsy, alone, um, and frustrated with their life is listening to this. Somebody who just got fired is listening to this. Somebody starting their business is listening to this. So I'm hyper aware of the insecurities of the person listening, and I'm asking questions for them. Does that make sense? Yeah, completely it does. And I think that that informs the questions much differently than if you're asking just to build your brand or... Uh, generate leads or monetize or uh, you know show people that hey I interviewed this cool person right those are all cool things nothing wrong with any of those things Um, but I was coming from such a deep place and here's the other thing Sonia you have to understand when I was interviewing Tom Hot Cheetos this for my entire first year I was totally broke so I needed these answers for for me too so I wasn't you know a lot of people are one wealthy person interviewing another wealthy person I, there were times where I didn't have enough money to get to um, the place. I remember one time I didn't even have enough money to Uber there and I didn't have a car. So I had a buddy drop me off to interview Grant Cardone. Like that's how broke I was. So when I went to an interview, the stakes were so high and I had nothing. So I was asking questions, just, I needed all of it. I needed, well, you know, so I would ask questions of things I was dealing with that the audience would have no idea. So I would say things like, you know, and what would you tell people who are maybe starting to get a little bit of momentum what they're doing, um, but are totally broke and trying to figure out how to monetize, right? I would ask questions like that for the audience, but secretly it was also for me. Well, yeah. So every interview I was, I was kind of like, I was really not just asking questions. I needed specific answers. And I think all those little micro distinctions, people felt that. So do you think by doing your interview, your interviews to billionaires, and, and that was going to be one of my questions, why, why billionaires? I mean, there's an obvious answer around that. You're surrounding yourself by wealth. Yeah. But are you fulfilling a void? Um, when I, uh, in interviewing? Yeah. Well, you're, you're, yeah, something you're, you're. Yeah, totally. For me, I mean, for me, I always, I've always been an intellectual, always. Um, and I found it so hard to, um, date women my age because you know I, I'd be 21 like hey let's go to a Tony Robbins seminar let's read this book I'm reading biographies and most women you know just want to look good they want to look sexy they want to go to the club they want to have a drink they want to go to the bar they want to go out they want to go to dinner you know uh, even my friends guys you know we'd go out and you know, they want to do those same things too or maybe just go to the gym or they're but nobody wanted to go to like a Tony Robbins seminar that cost a thousand dollars right or go to a breakthrough experience, right? Or, or, uh, you know, and so I I found myself having all these desires for high quality conversations, but there was a huge void in terms of nobody wanted to talk to me. You know, my, my mom and dad didn't care about personal development. My sister didn't care about personal development. My friends didn't care about it. There was nobody that cared about it. Most people in their twenties just want to go to university, get a job and move on. Right. Um, but as soon as I found the world of Tony Robbins seminars, I would go and I'm like, oh my God, there are thousands of people just like me that are also weirdos in their home. But when we come here, we're like weirdos together. Right. And I'm sure you understand the feeling. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, Where do you think that thirst came from? Was there anything that you can go back to your childhood and. Yeah. Wow. This is good. You're good. You're good, Sonia. This is a great question. Um, I was alone a lot as a kid, a lot. And, um. And I, and I was always an intense kid, intellectually intense. Um, and I always want, well, I want to, well, how come, dad, how come he's rich and has a big house and a red car called a Ferrari and has a private jet, but we live here and this, or how come, dad, do people really get paid millions of dollars to play soccer or football? Dad, how, you know, so I was always trying to make sense of how people got to high places if they were just like, me, me and you, right? They're made of the same skin and bones. They have 10 fingers. 
if we're the same, same height, relatively look the same, how come some people end up there and we're here? What, what, what happened, you know? And I just remember at, from a young age being fascinated with that, even to the degree where I, if I would see somebody at a gas station or something in a Ferrari, you know, I, you know, I was a little kid. I was like, excuse me, mister, you know, what do you do for a living? Or, you know, what, what did you, where did you go to school or college or, you know, I would always ask for advice. And so I think I always had that curiosity but I never got to satiate it anywhere. I never got to uh, fulfill it or whatever. And now I make a living doing that with the best in the world. So I found a way to totally not have to, you know, I think most people, it's kind of like, you know, in school when you're the type of kid who has a lot of questions in class, but you're kind of embarrassed when you're younger because you don't want other people to like think you talk too much or ask a silly question. I was always that kid who had a lot of questions, but wouldn't always ask because I didn't want to be judged. Uh, but finally, I found a vehicle to channel all my intensity into, my passion into, my intellect into, my um, my adrenaline into, my my confidence into, my everything into. And um, you know, and then people loved it. And people would say, "Oh my God, Omar, I love your interviews. Oh my God, Omar, great question. You're such a great communicator." And imagine, put yourself in my shoes. I went from zero wins and feeling like I had so much potential to starting to do interviews. And now I have fans, I have fan mail, I have subscribers, people want to pay me for coaching. Um, people love my interviews. I'm getting recommendations. You know, Ed Milet came to me because Grant Cardone told him to do an interview with me. They're coming to me. All of a sudden, I was like, oh, my God, I found my genius. I found the thing that I have been trying for so long to, to, to realize. And it was just a pivot and a mental perception of turning my pain into power away. And I just did that and I just built the confidence with interviews. So I learned nuances of how to ask questions, how to really care. And, and really, and to answer your question more specifically, this is going to sound simple, but if you meditate on it, this is how you give a good interview. Actually care. When you genuinely care about the questions you're asking, it's an entirely different universe than if you're just asking questions from your head. When you ask questions, stay present to them. Um, you, you'll be blown away at how many people around the world actually care about the same things that you care about if you just have the confidence to ask, you know, and, and to go a, a layer deeper. For example, when I interviewed billionaire John Paul DeJoria, he had just sold Patron Tequila for 5.1 billion cash. He told me that, and I could have moved on, but the interviewer in me, right, for people listening, wanted to know, holy shit, what's that like when the check clears? Yeah, yeah, oh. <laughs> exactly. So what did I ask <laughs> Go yeah. Buy some <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Drinks on me. So, so, so I asked him, I said, you know, and I wanted, you know, and he was going on a tangent, you know, and he's a billionaire. So it's a little bit intimidating to excuse me, sir, or interject, but I had to ask him because I know people listening are going, holy shit, 5 billion direct deposit in your bank account. Imagine that Sonia. Hmm. And so I said, I said, well, you know, um, I said, well, let me ask you this, Mr. DeJoria. The moment that money cleared in your bank account, two questions. Number one, what, did it, what does it feel like? And he goes, uh, he goes, well, you look at it a couple of times, you look around, you say, oh my, is this real life? And then you realize it is. So that was the first thing he said, oh my God, you know, holy shit. And then I said, you know, and then the next question is, what's the first thing you spent the money on? And he said, first thing I did is I wrote a check to charity for $50 million cash. Oh, and and I, I remember him tell, looking into my eyes mm -hmm. the same way I visualized it happening. And I remember him telling me that and I got goosebumps, yeah. you know, and I, I said, holy shit, like I'm in the rooms with world shakers that like donate $50 million to charity just like that. You know, most people will never even touch a fraction of that in their lifetime. And here he is. I'm in the energy space of that. And, uh, you know, so when you have moments like that, it's just. And I can't tell you how many people message me. Oh, thank you so much. I loved when you asked that. A lot of people wouldn't have the confidence to ask someone that. But when you really care as an interviewer, um, I find that if you let the person who's talking go on the tangents they're going on and ask them about that, that will inform a much better interview than if you have a rubric in your head of X amount of questions that you're trying to check off the list before the timer runs out, right? Yeah, um, you, you've got to be present. I mean, I, I do... You, you, Obviously, you do your research, but as I said to you at the beginning of this interview as well, let, let, let's just let's let it flow because yes. when you're in flow, that's when the best things come to you. Right. 
Um, I did want to pick up on, on a word that you said when you were talking there, and you said you meditated on something. Right. What part does meditation play on your life? What does meditation play a part? In oh, it's huge. Medi meditation for me is huge. Um, you know, one of my students, so I have a, in my group coaching program, I always have these fun activities. So all of July, for example, I challenged everybody to meditate 20 minutes a day. Um, there's an interesting quote one of my students sent me. Um, it was something, uh, you know, I normally have stuff memorized, but this was a new one, so I don't. But it was something to the effect of all man's problems are rooted in their inability to sit alone in silence uh, for, a, for a period of time to reflect on things. And I think for me, meditation um, is kind of like, um, it's kind of like going slower so you can see more. It's kind of like, you know, if I'm driving 100 miles an hour in a car, I'm not going to notice the same the beauty around me as much as if I'm parked, mm. right? Because when you're parked, you can take a full rounded, well-rounded perspective. Mm. And sometimes I find that, you know, I know a lot of friends, you know, a lot of people would say that I have a mellow pace, meaning I take my time when I do things and I do them right. A lot of other people are very like, oh, I gotta do this, gotta do that, oh, I gotta do this, I gotta call her, I gotta call the guy, I gotta do this, I gotta do that, I gotta do that, right? And yet they don't end up very far in life, even though they get to everything very fast and are moving very fast. But I find that if I do three things that really matter, it'll take me way further than if I do 10 things just because, uh, you know, just because I had to do it and I'll feel productive if I hit every single thing at the time target. Um, so for me, meditation is really about doing less, uh, better. And the way I explain meditation to people is it's kind of like, especially 20 minutes TM, which is, you know, the meditation I do. Um, I kind of think of meditation kind of like a hamster wheel, right? You know how a hamster, imagine a hamster gets on a wheel, right? And at first it like runs, right? It like runs and runs and runs and runs and runs. And I think that's most of our brains, right? I'm sure you can relate, Sonia, you're an achiever. And, um, you know, I, you know, I, I still have this too, by default. I think most people do say you get home, you sit on your couch after a long day. Most people don't sit back and go, wow, what a beautiful day, man. I love my life man. I'm so grateful for all the things in it, man. What a lovely meal I had. It was so nice to see those beautiful people today. <sighs> I'm grateful to be alive. Right. We don't do that. Most of us go home and we go, oh, shit, I got to do this. I got to clean this. Oh, I got to wake up here. Oh, I got to get the workout. Oh, I forgot to cook. Oh, I forgot to call them back. Oh, I got to send the email. Oh, I got to get the thing. Oh, I got to get the money. Oh, I got to check my account. Oh, I get right. We, we do this whole thing and then we go to sleep and we wake up and do it again. Um, so for me, what meditation does, it allows me to take conscious control of the narrative and not be distracted by the world, right? So when you close your eyes, you can't be distracted by this or that or the call or this or the right. You can only turn your eyes and go inward. And I think most of us have a bunch of disorder inwardly when we try to solve it externally. This is why, for example, most of us have our breakthrough thoughts uh, when we're in the shower, right? That's a form of meditation because it's uninterrupted. We're, we're totally in our head. We're not distracted by a bunch of new physical things a myriad of distractions and colors and lights and pulls at our attention and phone calls and texts and notifications and images and videos and scrolling and likes and right we're just in the shower just us and some steam totally naked totally pure and water is sort of cleansing our thoughts right so for me much like a hamster wheel i feel med a 20 minute meditation session the first five minutes of a meditation the hamster wheel is running oh i gotta do this i gotta do this you know you know, for people who are new to meditation, oh, this is not working. This is stupid. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm thinking too much. I'm thinking too much. Yeah. Oh, stop yeah. Thinking, stop that's why a lot of people say, oh, I can't shut off my yeah. mind. Yeah. Don't you don't realize that's not, that's not what meditation's about anyway. Yeah. Yeah. That's not. You the, 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 observe the thoughts. Don't, don't put them away. Don't judge, them. Yeah. Yeah. Don't judge them. Don't it's judge them. Good. Love them. Learn them. Label them. Um, so, so, you know, so the first five minutes of the hamster wheel, your brain will still, I got to do this, I got to do that, I got to do that. The next five minutes, a little slower. And now you're not the hamster running on the wheel. Now you're kind of walking on the wheel, you know? And then the next five minutes, you take your time and go, why am I on the wheel? So you kind of get off the hamster wheel and just kind of relax, just sit down, right? Kind of observe your thought. And then the last five minutes, you can start to appreciate life. The last five minutes, you can start to plan your day. You realize, 
oh, I don't have to do these 10 things. If I just do these two things, that'll get everything done. Mm -hmm. um, you know, simple things. Like I remember, you know, you know, fortunately because of the show, I've been able to, you know, create a really good income starting in, you know, the end of 2018, early 2019. And so I was able to, you know, hire an assistant. And I remember having all these problems and challenges written down. And I realized I could delegate all of this. Like, and so instead of 20 things every day, what if today I just had one thing of find an assistant and then that could take care of those 20 things, yeah. right? But that, that idea came to me in a meditation. And I know that sounds obvious. Some people go, well, I don't need meditation for that. Okay, fine, maybe you don't. But I guarantee you, you know, so often, so many of us are looking for answers. And I ask people, I say, you know, hey, Sonia, if you were looking for, um, say, your car key, I don't know if you have a car, but um, I know in the UK, a lot of people walk. Um, but, you know, say you were looking for something. Lately. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, say you were looking for something inside of, say you lost your car keys, right? You wouldn't go outside your home to look for them, right? You would look inside. Yet most of us, when we're looking for answers, we go outside. Yeah, yeah. So what I tell people to do is close your eyes, turn around and look inside, you know? And when you do that, you, 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 you become more connected to yourself. You become more confident in your decisions. Uh, you become less stressed about things you have. A, and this is the other thing you develop, um, you know, in homeostasis, right? The body is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Dr. D Martini talks about the order of balance. In the universe. So many of us forget to calibrate our balance. Hmm. We wake up, we open our eyes and go, oh, shit, I got to do this. I got to do this. I got to do this. I got to go to the gym. I got to go here. I got to go. Even if you're making money and you're fit and you're successful, you have a great relationship. You can't sustain that without some sort of consequence, without some sort of stress, burnout, lashing out at your partner, lashing out at yourself, being hard on yourself. So for me, meditation is just a center. It's my homeostasis. It's my, um, it's my home. It's my emotional home that I know exists. And so at, throughout the day, if I get stressed or intense, I know I want to be in a meditative state. I have a mental reference of what that feels like. If I don't, I live every day waking up and reacting to chaos. But if I can have 20 minutes where I control totally my emotions, totally the mental dialogue, and I can take inventory of it, oh, I have center for the rest of the day. I've got to so say, that, it's been an absolute game changer for me. You know, I, d I discovered, I discovered, I started meditating years ago, um, and, and and now I'm doing even more, especially during this this period. Uh, and it's and it is, as you say, it's it's a complete game changer. What other things for you would you say are your top <clears throat> rituals that set you up for success for the day? You yeah. About meditation. So, are there any? Yeah, so, <clears throat> so for me, I have outcomes. Um, I have to-do lists. I always make to-do lists as much as I try not to, just to take inventory of stuff. But realistically, you know it, I know it, you know, whoever's listening to this knows it. You don't always get all the things on your to-do list. You never right? get half of them done. <laughs> yeah, and there's yeah, always exactly. something else that you, that you put on by the end of the day. Yeah, and, and, and also, let's face it, you know, we've all had days where, where we write down everything and then go to lunch and do absolutely none of it, right? You come home and you're like, you know what? I'm just going to have a relaxed day. Maybe you just get a workout in or something and then kind of I'll get to that tomorrow or whatever. And that's okay. I've learned to be kind to myself. Uh, but I, I deal with outcomes. So the way I do it is I look at my, I have three monthly primary outcomes and then I have weekly outcomes and I have daily outcomes and I do it in three. So I have three daily outcomes, three weekly outcomes, three monthly outcomes and three yearly outcomes. So I just think in terms of outcomes and that gives me the perfect amount of um, freedom and flexibility, but also direction to make sure I'm getting things done. But I also give myself leeway if I don't get everything done that day. Right? So for example, let's say, Let's say, for example, my um, uh, let's say my my outcome for the week, my top three outcomes are, you know, release uh, three interviews or three videos on YouTube, um, get five workouts in, and um, you know, and um, generate X amount of revenue or something, right? Um, okay, there's seven days in a week, so I want to get five workouts in. You know, sometimes, you know how it is, sometimes you don't get to the workout or things happen or, you know, something gets in the way. But if I have seven days to do five workouts, then I have one or two days where yeah, I Yeah, you don't push. do one workout on that day, then exactly. you've got to do it tomorrow. Otherwise, you're exactly. down by one day, right? Yeah. Exactly, yeah. But it gives me that little bit of leeway to where, I, you know, I say it's late or whatever, I had a long day and I didn't get to the workout. And if I, if I work out now, it'll throw off my sleep schedule because it'll keep me up. 
But because that was my weekly outcome, I stay flexible. Instead of beating myself up that I didn't work out Monday, I'm like, oh, it's okay. I'll make it up Saturday. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So it gives me that flexibility and freedom to be kind to myself, but also to get the outcomes. Because you don't care about the individual activity. The goal is the outcome. Yeah, so it's that's consistency it. and it's over time. Yeah. Over, exactly. Yeah. But so many of us, damn it, why don't I do this? And then that now creates a negative anchor, a negative reinforcement, a negative emotion. It's going to blind you from doing positive stuff and the other thing. So there's a domino effect to emotions. So I'm very conservative about my negative dominoes. I never want to tip one negative domino because then you know how it is. And then they can be off. And this happens. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, so, so that, that ritual helps me. It gives me the perfect amount of flexibility and freedom. And then I have outcomes for the month. And when you think of it that way, it kind of gives you flexibility and, and, and um, you know, a target, but also flexibility. So that's been huge um, outcomes instead of, you know, trying to hit every single thing. Um, the second thing I do is, um, and I mentioned it prior, is I've learned to be super kind to myself and loving to myself. Yeah, that's very and important. Very that, good. Is so, that is so important. And so few people do this. Yeah. Um, you know, I've learned to really be kind and loving to myself because let's face it, you can't guarantee on anybody else doing that. Mm. And the achiever syndrome is it's, you know, a lot of us live in that. It's not enough. I need more money. I need more followers. I need more subscribers. I need more of this, right? We live in that ego game of more, 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 more. Um, and I realize, you know, in the great words of, um, Dr. Wayne Dyer, you know, I'm not, I'm not, um, another great Yes, I'm not a, uh, I'm not a, a, a spiritual, I'm sorry, I'm not a human being having a spiritual experience. I'm a spiritual being having a human, human experience. experience absolutely. And so as a, as a spiritual being, it is so important that your spirit is in a good energy, a good vibration. And you can be in that if you're, if you're broke or you're making X amount of money. And I've been times caught up in, oh, how come I'm not making this much? But I look back and I go, holy cow, like, what I'm making now is phenomenal. But of course, I'm looking at the guy making 20 million, you know. You're comparing, which is another judgment that you yeah. shouldn't be doing. You're comparing totally. yourself to somebody else. Totally, yeah. And I, you know, I make more than most people on the planet do. And yet I'm focused on what this guy's making because it's 10 times more, right? And so, and, and, and um, I, I forget who said this, but they said the challenge is if money is the primary goal, um, money is made of numbers and numbers never end. So you'll never win that game if you're only playing. You can work at it. You can get better. But if that is your primary, you feel I will only rule in your head. I will only feel good about myself when you're chasing an impossible carrot, yeah. you know, instead of being grateful for what you have. And so, you know, for me, that's huge. And then the last thing, other than being kind to myself and loving when I say I fail or fall short or whatever happens, I'm, you know, really loving kind to myself. The, the last thing is um, I always make it a point to give. Um, and I tell people who are broke, um, there's been times, Sonia, where I was down to my last, you know, maybe thousand dollars or whatever, um, uh, maybe sometimes less than that. And I would, you know, here in the States, we have, we have some, you know, sometimes in poor areas, you have people selling flowers or selling whatever on the street. Um, you know, and sometimes I see mothers and I don't judge them. You know, I, I used to judge, oh, well, maybe they're drunk, right? Maybe they're whatever. But I've learned to not judge. You know, if I can, I give. And uh, I remember, like, I would take out a hundred dollar bill and give it to them, and spend time with them, and be kind to them, and talk to her. How's your day going? How's your day? And they're and they start crying that I gave them a hundred dollars, right? And and I had nothing. I would be broke. I would be whatever. But I made it a habit of always giving, even if I didn't have a lot. Uh, and you know, as I got more, you know, we donate to various organizations and stuff. But I find for me, anytime I'm stuck drained, uh, creatively frustrated, I've hit an income plateau, um, frustrated, overwhelmed, stressed, whatever. Um, those are, I learned this from Tony, those are symptoms of the ego. And you can only feel bad when you're thinking about yourself, when you're selfish, right? Like there's so many people in the world who need love, who need stuff. And yet here we are alone, like, God damn it, why don't I make more money? Or like, how come nobody this? Right? That's such an egocentric yeah, thing. You're thinking of yourself. And we all get caught up in it, you know? So whenever I get caught up in it, I just, I'm like, okay, I got to go help someone. Maybe it's not money. You know, we have a homeless shelter that I volunteer time at. And I find that some of my best business ideas, some of my best clients, and by the way, coincidentally, some of the wealthiest people you'll ever meet and that I've ever met 
are also doing those things. They're also at the charity event. They're also volunteering at the thing. So that becomes the client. That becomes the new interview. That becomes the energy. And you can't always know that in advance. And I don't do it for that, but there's multiple benefits. So for me, I find that that has been huge, you know, focusing on outcomes, being kind and loving to myself, visualizing and specificity, and also m- making it a point to be in a giving energy. Because in that same energy, it just, you're, you're just in a, fl- you're just good things happen. You know, when I spend three hours at a homeless feeding and my phone is away, by the time I get back to my car and see my phone, I don't know what it is, but there's always good news. There's always, um, you know, a new business opportunity or a new interview that got lined up or, and I th- I can't help but think that it's because I'm in a space of giving to the world and contributions yeah, and you, you energy is just, I'm in that flow. Yeah. So th- those are the core things for me that really, I think, make the difference. The other thing is when I write goals and I learn this from my coach, I write them in the present tense. Yeah. So I say, I see myself interviewing Tony Robbins. I see myself instead of I want to, I would like to, it's written in the present. I see myself. Well, That's- let's just talk about that for one minute because we couldn't end yeah. this interview without yeah. to- talking about the king himself, to old Tony. Yeah. So come on, when are you going to get him on your show, Omar? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so I, um, so actually, uh, Tony heard about my show through Dean Graziosi. I've had Dean on twice. Dean's become a great friend. And uh, Dean told Tony about my story, which was like, oh my God, right? Um, which is funny because in my visualizations, I wrote down, um, something similar that Tony will be a fan of and know my story. I had no idea that it would manifest the way it did, but I wrote it down that Tony would reach out to me and that did happen crazy. But, um, um, when I went down there in Florida, uh, well, let me tell you really quick. So when I interviewed Dean, I told Dean about my rock bottom. And I forgot to mention this in the story as I was explaining where the show started. Um, but when I was listening to um, my coach and all this, I, there was one thing that Tony said that never left me. And that is that nothing in life has any meaning except the meaning that I give it. Yes. Nothing yeah. in life has any meaning except the meaning that I give it. And if there's any one piece of advice I can give to anybody, that till the day I die is my number one best piece of advice. It's the best thing I've ever, there's all these one liners I remember, but if there's anything I would tell anybody, it is to remember that, that nothing in life has any meaning except the meaning you give it. So, um, and I got to tell, I got to tell Tony that I got to tell Tony that, that it changed my life. I remember when I met Tony, I was crying and he was crying and it was such an, you know, I had all these things planned for what I was going to say and, but I was going to ask him, I'm sure you could relate. And all I could think to say in that moment, Sonia, is thank you. And I just hugged him. And I just, I, the words couldn't come. To, I was so emotionally overwhelmed. And he, he's played a massive, massive impact on my life. I, I wouldn't be sitting opposite uh, you here now. My, my first experience of personal growth, and we're going back years, uh, was UPW. And I did that years ago. And that was my first taste of personal growth. Um, and, there will never be another. There will never be another Tony Robbins. No, and and, and you know, and, and and John, who John Demartini, who's very different to Tony, but right. he really had a massive impact on my life. And, and you, uh, mentioned, yes. you mentioned the great Wayne Dyer, God bless his soul, um, another person that's had a huge impact. Um, yes. On my life. Um, yes. But Tony, have you have you got a? I mean, I know you've done a lot of work this year on his yeah. PBB um, program and promoting yeah. that. Can you tell me a little bit more about that and and yeah. where that's going and where you see the whole events business, I guess, going? And yeah. I we've got to wrap it up soon, but we've got to talk yeah. about COVID and where you, and I know we're coming out of it. Oh. I don't want to be pessimistic. Always believe in the optimistic yeah. side of things. Yeah, so, totally. So, so, um, just to finish up that point about the Tony and then I'll get to that is, um, you know, I got to tell, when I got to meet Tony, I told him that, and, you know, I was crying and he was crying, he gave me a big hug. And, uh, and of course I used the opportunity I said, by the way, Tony, I would love to have you on the podcast, you know? And he was like, yeah, just talk to my assistant, set it up with my assistant. So we were in touch and we were talking to set it up and then COVID happened. So there went that, um, but it's okay. I believe that, um, I actually believe that, um, you know, 
that universe, God, whatever you want to call it, I believe that what's going on with COVID needed to happen. Yeah. I, I think so many topics that are sensitive have exploded from, um, you know, from, you know, the, the situation with, you know, different races to the situation with uh, police brutality, which I think to a certain degree is exaggerated in a lot of ways, but I think is also true in a lot of ways. And so I think a lot of these truths are coming to light. And I think there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of relationships. I don't know if it's the same in the UK, but in the US, the divorce rates have been exploding. Um, people, I mean, a lot of people getting divorced because they're spending so much time quarantined oh, together. I, mean, I, I, I broke up in, in lockdown in a relationship and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, was, it wasn't the greatest time for me, but you know, I, I look, I'm, I, I'm choosing to look at the benefits of the situation and how it was meant to be and, uh, right. and all the rest of it. But yeah, at the time it was incredibly painful. I'm, wasn't used to being locked down with any with myself let alone yeah. anyone else i mean i'm, I'm a big freedom person i love my freedom so and by the way by the way same with me I, I ended a relationship recently i mean it was mutual but um it was it was recent too it was just about what two two months ago or so so um yeah so i think i think in a in an interesting way it's almost like a cleansing for the planet in a certain way because relationships that shouldn't be together are ending. Um, people are spending more time with loved ones. People internally are really focusing on what matters and there's no distraction of uh, making money of work. You don't enjoy right? There's no, there's very little. Distraction. <laughs> Let's face yeah. it. We're not materialism. It's not like you need to go and buy a new outfit because you've got nowhere to go to wear the outfit. Exactly. All of these things are just, just seem like, well, what's the point? Because yeah, Louis Vuitton. I we were even uh, my team was reading an article that Louis Vuitton, Gucci, or Mez, or right, all the top fashion brands are struggling right now because nobody's buying anything because people only buy that to wear it when they go out, so people yeah, can see them with it. So nobody leggings and gym <laughs> yeah. kit all day. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, those stuff are selling like crazy, yeah. you know. Um, but yeah, so so I think um, I think it's a. I see my Louis Vuitton wallet in the corner. <laughs> it's funny, but as you know, I, so I think that COVID, you know, and this is maybe a divine, you know, woo woo perspective for some, but I think that uh, we're going through a universal cleanse in a sense, not just with health, not just with race, not just with uh, relationships, but I think overall, it's like kind of like the whole world needed a big, just, just a big shower. And I think um, to a certain degree, this is it. It's unfortunate that so many people are getting sick and it's, it's heartbreaking to think about the amount of people that have lost jobs and industries that have collapsed. Uh, but Dr. D, like D, Dr. D. Martini says, the universe works in perfect balance. So for every challenge, there's an equal benefit. And I think the fact that we're having such a tremendous amount of challenges also means there's a tremendous amount of challenges. So I just try to focus my lens on that. Um, you know, and fortunately, you know, for me and you, we're, we're in the digital business. And so, you know, our, our business has been exploding since this situation. And, and I'm just really trying to um, really like be cognizant of like, wow, like, you know, because just before this, I was actually about to launch a live events business doing seminars. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to have a few events and take them worldwide. And I was getting really focused and excited and, and, and really motivated. And then this happens and I'm like, oh, shit, where's the sustainability in this now? You know, put all this time, effort, energy. And when is it going to open up? you know every time it opens i'm in california so it opens and closes everything opens and closes so i'm not planning anything for 2020 but and then it also does make me think because I, now i see tony he's doing his upw for the first time ever virtual did you so see much. it I, I i did his challenge well i i tuned into some of his challenge he did last uh -huh. week and then he put out I, i'm sure i'm sure you've seen this this amazing super wall it was like zooms everywhere and it was like yeah. from the matrix or from you know yeah. uh, mission impossible where it was, uh, yes. looked amazing yeah it looked amazing and but but it also in a kind of way made me a little bit um dare i say fearful um not of not of uh anything other than maybe maybe un uncertain is a better word it made me a little bit more uncertain about what is the future of live events i'm like dang if the king of live events, Tony Robbins, isn't doing them. How the hell am I going to do, you know, seminars? But uh, I think there will always be a space for oh. in-person events. I think human beings crave that kind of in-person connection. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm all about people, as, as I know you are as well. And I, 
I, I absolutely massively miss human connection. Our, our local coffee shop has just started opening up. It's all social distancing. And I was yeah. sitting in there today. So I, I, I tend to get my energy and doing a bit of research on my computer. I like to walk about and just feel the vibe. Yeah, yeah. And I just miss it so, so much. And, you know, yeah. events, I mean, I, I was leading one of our largest personal growth communities here that was all based wow. on Tony Robbins. Um, and wow. I gave up leadership of that position literally two weeks. And John DeMartini was on stage. I got John on stage wow. two weeks before COVID hit and we were in lockdown. And, and wow. then they've never had a, they haven't had a live event. And that's been going 26 years since the founder went to UP, Tony's UPW. Um, so that's that's saying something, and and you know events. It's it's not it's not just the personal growth business. It's sports, huge sporting events, clubbing events. I mean, I I, I love dancing. Uh, yeah. I love good DJs. So that that's my little passion. And you know, of course, none of that's happening. I beat his clothes. Yeah. Uh, so, but yeah, I I don't think we can ever get away from connection. Um, yeah, I think I think. Um... I think uh, it, it'll be interesting, the landscape of business, particularly in the personal development industry, how it evolves. But I think, um, I think I, I personally think that when things open up totally again, people are going to be dying to go to events. People are going to be rushing to, I think, think, I think for all the lost time, we will more than make up for it with the explosion of demand. I think people can't wait to hug, especially, you know, I mean, you're from the UPW world, you know, we all walk in. We all walk in the yeah. We all walk in the first time, first day ever, kind of unsure. Seconds, sure. seconds, yeah. You got to give that proper hug. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and by the end of it, man, it loves and hugs yeah. and squeezes them, and you can do it. I believe in you. I love you. You got this. We'll keep in touch. What's your Instagram? What, what's your Facebook? Yeah, such a, such a God. That's why I love Tony so much. He's his soul has brought so many beautiful people from all over the world together. You know, some of my it's interesting, Sonia. Some of my best friends, you know, I've had people that I grew up with for years, but some of my best friends are people that I met at UPW that live in Brazil or Germany or Australia or the UK or whatever that I met a year ago or two years ago. I've been to multiple UPWs. So have you been to a day with destiny? No. And again, that was one I was probably going to, oh, I've nearly gone. Ah, I would have seen oh, you there. Yeah. I went in December. Yeah. I, yeah. I'll tell you a funny story maybe after this interview finishes. <laughs> okay, will do. So very, what I wanted to ask you though is, and, and is where can people find out more about you if they're watching this? Yes. Um, and I know you offer your service and services in terms of setting up podcasts. Um, mm -hmm. oh, well, I'll let you tell, tell the audience yeah. a bit more about what you do and how they can find out about you. Yes. So if you guys want to check out any of the interviews, obviously you can uh, YouTube search The Passionate Few. It's available on all podcast platforms worldwide. So um, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube. If you want to listen to the video or the audio or whatever, it's available everywhere. You can just search my name, Omar Elitar or The Passionate Few. On Instagram, you can find me at Omar underscore the rock star. Um, my ex-girlfriend made that a name and I just never changed it. Where did so that come Oh my yeah. so I actually nearly thought that is very yeah. that's a very strange. Yeah, you know, you know, actually, actually it's interesting. I, and it's funny, this goes back to Tony. So do you remember at UPW when Tony says to come up with a name for the version of you that's like the rock star? Yes, yes, like, yes. Up with like whatever, Sonia the Titan, Tony the Titan, Tony yeah. the Titan, whatever. So um I went with my ex-girlfriend to UPW, which by the way, I highly recommend going with a significant other to those events. I think they're great. Um, uh, and, uh, the name I wrote down was Omar, the rock star. And she was like, Oh, why don't, when I started Instagram, she was like, Oh, why don't you just make it that? So I said, okay, I ran with it. And then, you know, people started recognizing me as Omar, the rock star. So I just kind of, I just kind of ran with it. You know, it's just kind of fun. And also it's kind of more memorable than just my name. And sometimes people have a hard time pronouncing the name. So it just kind of stuck, you know, I, I you know, I didn't really think about it much more than that. It's um, great. You're the rock star. Yeah. yeah, Omar the rock star. And it also has created an identity. I'm like, dang, now I have to perform. Now I have to get big interviews, right? And now, now, now you have to get Tony Robbins. And, and, I, and I see it. Yeah. I, I see him. I, I they, offered me, they offered me a Zoom interview. Um, and I said, uh, you know what? It's okay. I'll wait. So um, that'll happen. If you guys are watching this, 
hold me accountable. Um, it'll be out, God willing, um, early 2021, but we'll see what happens with this whole COVID situation. Maybe we'll do a Zoom as a, as a pre-warm-up. I like for that, early 2021. I think you've just put that, I think you put that in writing and visualize it. Yeah. Um, and I could talk, I feel there is definitely a part two coming. But you know what? Our part two will be in person as well. <laughs> I think that's Let's do it. Or we can do another part two over Zoom and a part three in person. Whatever you want, Sonia, I got you. Um, my last question, um, and it's a question I ask to all my guests, is if you were to write a message in a bottle for future generations to find, oh. what would that message be? Uh, oof. Uh, it would be um, follow your compass. Um, be kind to yourself, uh, parentheses, um, even when no one else is. You are okay the way you are. You are where you need to be. Focus on who you're being more than what you're doing. And pursue a mission more than you pursue um, success or failure. If you pursue meaningful things, um, you will live a meaningful life and you will not be attached to the comparison game. If you do these things, love yourself, be kind to yourself and help as many people as possible. Recruit other people to help you and seek wisdom from them. You will live the most meaningful life humanly possible. Wow. I love that. Things, I love that's that. what I would say. I love that, Pema. Yeah. Thank you so much. I just want to say namaste from my heart to your heart. Yes. It's, this has been amazing. Thank you so much. Namaste. And for anybody listening, make sure to subscribe to Sonia's podcast. Watch it on YouTube. Like it. Let her know if you enjoyed this interview. She's awesome. And I, I don't reach out to people uh, often. But as soon as I saw her stuff, I was like, man, this is, this is a woman with soul, with heart. She's just as beautiful on the inside as she is on the outside, and she really has a heart to serve. So uh, if you guys are listening to her, stay tuned because it's only going to get better and better. So thank you for having me on, Sonia, and uh, I hope uh, we brought a lot of value to people. Thank you. Thank you, Omar. Hope you enjoyed the show. Remember, there's a new interview out every Monday. So hit subscribe and like, and you'll get it straight into your inbox.